Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. It's an awesome day at the Reality Revolution. We have Kristen Fraser Johnson back and she has written one of the most amazing books of this year. I'm telling everybody to go read it. Heal the People, Expanding Human Consciousness for a Global Awakening. Clearly, Kristen put her heart and soul into this book and every chapter has amazing citations. She is very much like me and loves to read. And what I love about this is that she's gone into detail, citing the references that she had. She talks about her own personal journey. And the beauty of this is it talks about the different chakras and the systems and the personality systems. So I wanted to talk to Kristen a little bit more about her concepts that she brings up. It really kind of changed the way I understand the, the chakra system and the energy system. So... Thank you so much for this book, Kristen, and thank you so much um, for helping me to understand this. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor to just have conversations with people like you and people of like mind. So thank you. Thank you, Kristen. So tell me before we begin, and we talked about this a little bit more, what was your, uh, when you started to write this, what was your uh, motivation in writing this book? What is it you really wanted to spread the word on. Tell me a little bit more about how it came to be. Yeah. So the motivation for the book was really um, leaning into a life mission of what does it, what does it mean to heal? Um, mm -hmm. And I, we have talked about this a little bit before, but I saw, I had a vision of the book uh, when I journeyed with plant medicine. So I journeyed with Iboga and I mm -hmm. saw the cover and the title of the book. And this was, that was 10 years ago. And so I spent the last 10 years trying to figure out the answer to that question heal what does it mean to heal the people because that's all I got in the vision was the the cover you know and the title mm -hmm. and then I yeah. asked started asking that question what is what is healing what does healing mean and um and what would it look like to to see a world full of healed humans and so that was really the motivation was to first heal myself and, and then be able to deliver that as a message of kind of like hope and inspiration to other people who are like, you know, awakening and, and searching for healing. Right. So you talk about in the book, you had gone to a mystery school that sort of changed your understandings. Tell me a little bit more about that, um, your, what you learned from the mystery school about the energy system. Yes. So um, the mystery school was um, at the time, it was called the healer training program. And I was in my early twenties when I found the school. And for me, the school was like a homecoming because prior to finding the school, I was sort of like a solo seeker. I was like reading all these books and devouring this, you know, metaphysical information, but I didn't really know anybody else. Like, yeah. you know, any real human bodies that also liked the information as much as I did. And so when I found the school, it was almost like I found my kin, like I found this tribe of like minds. And I, mm -hmm. I, I wrote about it in the book. It, it, I found a sense of belonging in the world that I never even knew I longed for. And so finding these people, first and foremost, it gave me the container that I needed to feel safe enough to embody as a human being, to really yeah. ground myself down onto the planet. And all of the things that came with that, first, the community, the tribe, which I think is the most important thing for spiritual seekers is to have the like minds, but then it was the wisdom. And, you know, I had already done quite a bit of um, my own research and reading, but I was introduced to a few concepts that were totally new. And that was a lot of, um, what I write about in the book, like the profile work, the, the personalities right. I learned, I was first introduced to in the school. And that was like learning a language that completely catapulted my spiritual growth. So let's talk about that. You, before you go into the chakra system, you talk about energetic profiling through character structure. So this is uh, for people that are thinking, oh, I've already read everything about chakras. I, I don't need to read that. Trust me. No, no, this is completely different. Um, so talk a little bit about the that aspect of when you're talking about chakras to begin with. Yeah, so um, well, it's it's such a it's it's such a broad scope, right? Spirituality and expanding consciousness and chakras and profiles. There's so much to it. But to to put it simply, 
Um, we all, we are all beings of energy and how we manage our energy through our human system is how we create and express life force energy through ourselves and, and out into the world. It's how we create. Right. right. And most of us are doing it kind of unconsciously. Like we're not really aware always of how we're moving our energy. So understanding um, the chakras and this map of profiling, it gives us a language for understanding how we run our energy. And we just, our energy, like the chakras are kind of just the vehicle for how we run this energy, but we also run it through these archetypal patterns, which manifest as character structures. So that's the origins of the work was um, they were, they were called character structures. Right. And every single human falls under um, or lands within these categories of, of structures, personality structures, really. I'm absolutely fascinated with this because, um, you know, I, as I, as like you, as I've delved deeply into these um, alchemical books and um, hermetics and occult books and mystery school knowledge, um, you start to see the, the synchronicities. We, we see the tree of life and the 22 paths along the tree of life. And then you see, they read in the law of one and the archetypes that are described in the law of one. You read about, you see the tarot and, 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 and the different archetypes in the tarot. You see the, you know, astrological information, even some human design stuff. It all seems to have this similar pattern that uh, there uh, is, there, there's personality aspects that are a part of us that are existing sometimes outside of us, sometimes within us but as a part of our energy system. And we are going through a journey to understand these different archetypes. So I was excited to see that you had addressed this and it's, I'm still an infant in understanding this. So how many different personality structures are you talking about through, through this? Yeah, through the book. Yeah, so the way that I was taught is there's five. And that's what I love about this system too is because it's really simple. You don't mm -hmm. have to learn a ridiculous amount of combinations. It's a very simple language. But once you understand it, you almost understand every person in your life. And when it's coupled with the chakras, you really just have a blueprint for, for navigating your relationships. And it's the most transformative work. But there's five, right? So right. there's... Um, the way that I was taught by Reese Thomas is there's thinkers, feelers, caretakers, achievers, and leaders. And all of these profiles manage their energy very specifically. So they will have, they'll have different challenges in life. And that's why some people are like super good at certain things that it's effortless for them, but they really struggle in other areas. Where other people are like, oh, you know, so for example, um, being really grounded in the world, making money, doing business, organizing time, certain people are just really good at that. They've got a chakra for that. Other people might spend more time in the spiritual realm and they might really struggle in the world. You know, they might struggle to figure out what their, what their best career move is. They might be highly spiritually developed or really, really creative, but they can't remember what they had for dinner last night or, or how to, you know, structure their day. Um, someone else might be really, really good at reading emotions, but completely lack boundaries, you know? So it's mm -hmm. all, and it's all in how we manage our energy. Can we so encapsulate you know, all these personality structures as a single person? Am I limited forever to be a thinker? Am I limited forever to be a leader? I mean, am I stuck there? See, Can I is, not go outside of that structure? No, such a beautiful question too, because a lot of humans, we don't want to be labeled, right? Never. Because yeah. we know, Forget we know that we're, inf we know that we're infinite beings. Right. So what I love is that, um, one of, uh, one of the other authors, he, he wrote a book, um, the five personality patterns, Stephen Kessler. Mm -hmm. He says that every single human being on the planet in their core is pure presence. They are pure consciousness. So there's, there's different kind of languages for these profiles. Some identify them as behavior. They're like behavioral tendencies. Others will identify them as type. And I spent a lot of time asking like, okay, is it this or is it that? Are these right. soul qualities, right? Am I destined to be a thinker forever? Or are these just behaviors? And if I can manage my behavior, then I can return to pure presence, right? Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, Eckhart Tolle and the power of now and all of these great spiritual teachers, they talk about the present moment being the sweet spot that you want to get to. And so I do align with that is if you understand your tendencies, 
Like I'm always going to have a tendency to be a thinker, especially when I'm overwhelmed. If I'm overwhelmed, my tendency is going to be to energetically move away from my core and up and out of my body, because that's what my energy system does to feel safe. Someone else might have a totally different energy pattern. They might be an endurer. They might move their energy away from their core and down into the ground in order to endure that whatever is overwhelming them, right? Mm -hmm. Someone else might blow up. They might get really big and aggressive. All of these patterns, their energy patterns, we do them so we can feel safe. And the only way to genuinely, really, truly feel safe is to return ourselves to our core and to the present moment. So it's a language. Once you learn how you move your energy, when you're overwhelmed, it doesn't matter what type you are. You don't need to figure it out because at your core, you're pure consciousness. You are pure presence and you are in the moment. And that's what we all want. Is it specific to overwhelm or is it, is it more than that? Well, it's, it's, um, it's defense. So whenever we're feeling unsafe, whenever we're, fe- it could be, it could be overwhelmed. It's, could react, be it's react, instinctual reactive. Is that where it's coming? It's, it's, it's basically whenever we need to defend ourselves from what's happening in the present moment, we will use a strategy. So they're really strategies for, um, for safety, right? They're kind of like these strategies right. that human beings will do in order to try to, to try to take control of the, the present moment experience. So it's moving our energy away from our core and into a pattern in order to try to manage the energy as opposed to like letting the energy flow through us freely in a moment, unrestricted. Right. So we're letting the energy flow and that the best in the, in, in the present moment is the, the energy's flowing through all the chakras, not yeah. getting stopped at any point along the way. Is, exactly. Is, that's, that's what we want. That's what we okay. want. We want to be, be able to be consciously flowing in a moment where a lot of these patterns is this is what causes our energy to get stuck in very specific chakras. If you know the profile, you know, if you know your, you know, your archetypal profile, then you have a really good idea which chakras are going to give you trouble. So for the longest time, I was stuck in my root chakra. And, and as I've started to be able to see, at least I think I can, energies and talk where I start to get an, a, a feeling there where people's energies are stuck. I would say the majority of people I meet are stuck in their root chakra. That, that, that's my own opinion. I might be wrong, but I, I, get, I get this a lot. I, I, it's, it's all in the root. What is your opinion about that? I think most of the problems that we have are in the lower three. In the lower three, yeah. Yeah, because we're we're not really having a spiritual problem. We're having a human problem. (laughs) You know, most of the problems that we experience on this planet are within the dimension of um, the body, the body's desires, and our the body's desires for power right? It's like money, sex, power. That's where humans kind of, so like we're having issues with our health. We're having issues in our relationships. We're having issues in our career. We're not really- People need to feel safe. That's it. It's really hard for people to feel safe if they don't know when their next check's going to come or they're worried about something happening and they're scared. uh, You know, they're, they're scared for their lives. So- can we can we can we open the chakra in these extreme environments that we may find ourselves in in the modern day? You know, I think that um, most of the modern day fears and worries are really constructs of our consciousness, almost like hyper vigilantly trying to protect us from perceived threats. And a mm-hmm. lot of the times, most of the time, the threat is it's really in our mind, right? How many times have you really been, you know, has your physical safety really been being threatened? Because in that moment, you're going to react from survival. The problem is that we have 98% of the world reacting from survival 100% of the time. You know, we've got it backwards. Right. The war in Ukraine is all root chakra. You know, you know, conflicts that we see in the world, it's all root chakra that's going on, imbalances in that root chakra system. Am yeah. I right? And in and in that in that situation, right. sur- like operating from that survival, that sort of that human instinct for survival is completely appropriate because that's a reality that these people are facing, and it's horrific. And that is, like you said, that's the reality of a of a detriment to the root chakra. But a lot of times, 
human beings who aren't presently being faced with the threat are still reacting as though they are. Right. They experienced so the, a, a war in the past and it just never leaves. Exactly. We're, we're constantly living in that state of like needing to protect ourselves, needing to survive. And that's where this kind of this body armoring comes from, which is another aspect of the profile system is energetics. Um, right. There's a brilliant, brilliant man, Alexander Lowen and Wilhelm mm -hmm. Reich. Uh, Wilhelm Reich was the, you, I'm sure you've, yeah, I'm sure you've heard of him. He's the uh, creator of or organite and organ energy. Right. Um, so they were the pioneers of the, um, the profile system. And so what they talk about is this, this chronic need to defend ourselves creates these energy bodies around us that are, um, usually that they don't allow energy to flow through us. So Alexander Lowen went on to create um, a whole process called bioenergetics, which are the similar to kind of like Qigong or any yoga, any energy therapy to help restore and redistribute adequate energy flow to the body. So that way we're really flowing in the present moment. We're not behaving as if we're being threatened when we're not, but we right. know how to respond if we are. When you say energy body in my mind, um, and, and, and it's more than just that location in our body where the root chakra we are told is it's a body it's a there's a root chakra body right you're saying yeah. it's more than just a energy center it's a body right basically it's a it's a it's a level of consciousness that's the way that i perceive right. them okay. right so my teacher and i just had this conversation about okay like why should i even care about the chakras because most people can't see them you know most right. people aren't seeing these spinning balls of light inside a person's body so they're like what what gives why should i why should i even care about the chakras but the chakras are levels of consciousness that are like um fundamental to the human experience so you have to be able to use the language of the root chakra and be able to kind of like reflect on how that level of consciousness manifests itself in your life, right? If like, how do, how well do I flow that energy? Am right. I really jacked up in my root chakra and does my life reflect it? You know, right. so that it's I can only say personally, I, um, my root chakra being open has protected me. I was more secure in some extreme situations because I, I was rooted. So, you know, that's the, the biggest thing that people don't understand. If their root chakra is open, there is a greater level of security that occurs. It's hard to explain this sort of paradox, right? That's yeah, I think so. I think once it's, you understand the language, you have tools for life. That's what the, to right. me, that's what it is. These are all tools for how to navigate um, being human. So we move to the second chakra, the sensate system, you call it. So mm. talk to me more about, we, 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 um, I, I feel somewhat safe. I feel rooted. The energy body is flowing in my root. We move to the second chakra. Talk to me about what happens then. Yeah, what I love too is um, how these systems develop sequentially, right? So if you think mm -hmm. about um, at the root chakra level, it's all about survival. So at the root chakra level, it's like zero, zero to zero to six months of your age. You're just a you're just a body. You're just matter. You don't mm -hmm. your consciousness occupies a matter, but you don't know that you're separate from anything. You're just a perceiver of consciousness, but you're a perceiver of consciousness that needs to survive. It needs food. It needs shelter. That's mm -hmm. where the tribe comes in, right? So the root chakra is all about the tribe. That's why most spiritual people won't fully come down into their life purpose until they feel safe within a tribe. So the tribe is fundamental to the root. But once you're once you know how to survive and you're you know integrated, um, which I don't believe most of the planet even no, is. Like you said, most of the planet is still floating around. They haven't fully anchored down mm -hmm. um then you know between um six months to 18 months is when the sensate system starts to open up that's when you start to realize like oh like i have these hands and i'm separate from mom and i have these feelings and so you start to learn about um duality and separation you know and um most of us are really messed up in the second chakra as well, because this is where the shadow comes in, you know, the shadow aspect of humanity where there's parts that are good and there's parts that are bad. There's parts that I'm rewarded for and there's parts that I'm punished for having. Certain emotions are approved of. And so we're talking about the second chakra and how it's really the seat of the shadow, right? So Carl, Carl Jung talks about the shadow a lot and kind of popularizes that concept of like, there's these parts of the human that get rejected 
just because we reject them doesn't mean they go away. It just means they become unconscious. So the second chakra gets a little bit dicey because now, now we've kind of splintered from our, our wholeness, our holistic self. And we've created these sort of like um, subconscious aspects of the self. And now we've got, you know, parts of us that are good, parts of us that are bad. We judge others. And so integrating the shadow is so important to expanding our consciousness uh, because we really need to re-wel- like welcome back those rejected aspects so we can, we can be whole and complete. And that includes embracing the dark just as much as um, embracing the light side. So becoming aware of the darkness, not necessarily, when you say embrace the dark, you're not saying I, you know, that it's good, but you're just becoming, a, you're not pushing it down. You're becoming aware of it. Right? Bingo. Okay. Yeah. Bringing it to the, it's like using the light of consciousness. It's like shining a flashlight on the shadow actually takes its power away. It's not so scary anymore. It's only scary when we, we really reject it and, you know, we, we punish ourselves for having it and then we punish others, you know, and there's all this judgment as opposed to, let me just allow that to come up so I can witness it. So you, you're saying the key aspect of the second chakra is, is the shadow. If I want I to, uh, and let that energy run, I need to resolve these issues that I have maybe pushed down into my subconscious, right? Yeah. Okay. So then we move to the third chakra, which is the personal power system, right? So we're, we're moving to a point where we've resolved these issues and dualities within us. We feel secure and, and we're dealing with our own personal power in the environment around us, right? So tell me more about that. I think the the personal power system is so fundamental to the human because it really is the, it's like the ego, right? The seat of the ego. If the second chakra is the seat of the shadow, then the third chakra is how do we bring, how do we take action and bring movement into everything we've learned up until this point? So I have a body, my body has desires, and now how do we act in alignment, right? Like who, who am I in the world? And this is also where our um, personal evolution kind of steps in because before the third chakra opens, we are kind of just subject to our tribe. We accept what the tribe allows in terms of thinking, feeling, behaving, like we're very, very tribal. The third chakra, now we have an independent will. And that's usually right around um, like three years old where we become a big pain in everybody's ass because we want to do things our way. We have this independent will that is going to act separate from the tribe. Um, so it's really right. this per, like personal self that's developing. And very little of the planet has even reached that level, right? This is the yeah. first two that it, if you were to put it like billions and billions are still stuck in the first and second chakras, right? Yeah, if like, I really don't even believe that most of the planet has fully embodied Like, I don't even know how many people are actually genuinely like awake and present and in their body. It's a planet of philosophical zombies, essentially, right? Just kind of like little babies that are conscious that they're conscious, but that's it. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like we, we, we haven't, we haven't um, necessarily, I think we, I think we are developing spiritually. There is a, I do believe that there is a global awakening happening. We, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't. Yeah. We, you know, we wouldn't be conversations like this wouldn't be so um, you know, like so many people are having conversations and asking questions because the human, the human spirit is awakening. So then it's okay. What do what do we do? What do we do with our awakening? Because our awakening can't just stay in the upper chakras. Mm-hmm. We have to be able to ground it down onto the planet. And you know, in so many New Age circles, we see this. Everything is about ascension. Everything is about the upper chakras, and that's wonderful. And I love that. But if we can't anchor it, if we can't kind of clean up the the mess that's happening in the lower chakras. I'm not quite sure that just a spiritual awakening without the embodied human aspect of it is capable of really transforming the planet in the way that is being presently called for. Now, in your understanding of the chakra system, can I have my heart chakra open, but the second chakra closed? Or does the bottom lower chakras have to be opened to enable the higher chakras? What is your, because I've 
there's different systems. Some people believe, I mean, I kind of see it. Sometimes you see like stock market um, analysts, their third eyes open, but their heart's shut, right? They don't, they, they have no compassion, but they've, they've started to open their third eye, right? I mean, maybe I wanted to get your interpretation of that, right? Yeah, I think it's it's a whole system. And I don't think it's like, oh, you know, this chakra is just not open. I think that they're kind of always, energy is never really fixed, unless I would say there's like a major trauma. Like if there's a major trauma to, to the body or to a chakra, it can really, really stick the energy up in there. But for the most part, most of us are kind of like fluctuating all throughout our experiences. So right. I may be having a conversation with one person that lights me up. It lights up my intellect and I feel my heart start to open and expand. But then I might be in someone else's energy field that I don't really trust or maybe they hurt. So if so say your, your energy is always you know, adhering to the situation that you're presently in, right? So, you know, you might not feel safe in a certain environment and really kind of feel the need to block and defend yourself. The whole purpose of coming into consciousness is knowing when it's actually happening in the present moment and when it's something that happened in the past that you're just kind of reconstituting with your energy because you've lost connection to the present moment. Right. So we move to the fourth chakra, which I think um, it, when we talk about the the new earth, we talk about um, th that a, a world where those bottom three are are essentially open, and we've dealt with those, and we're moving into that system of compassion. The, you call it the compassionate system. So, talk to me about that. That's For my favorite system, because yeah. I think that the when the heart is open, it does this really beautiful thing that kind of aligns the rest of the system. I think when the, when the heart is open and activated, all the other chakras start to kind of come into harmony, come into alignment. And with whatever has been stuck, that's preventing us from sort of ascending our spiritual growth starts to gently come to the surface. So we can then begin to kind of, it's alchemy, right? As these kind of debris comes up from our energy, the heart is what allows us to really alchemize it. Mm -hmm. The heart is the most magnificent there's so much about the heart that we don't even, you know, we don't even, we've just barely begun scratching the surface on how powerful that energy is that emits from the human when they're, they're lit up and they're passionate and they feel connected. The heart is incredible. So the thinker can't is, has a harder time with opening the heart. Is that your interpretation from it? The thinker can, some of those higher chakras are, are golden, but the, the heart the compassionate system sometimes for some thinkers is a struggle. So the, the thinker usually struggles the most with the root. With the root? The, the rule keeper is the, has the most difficulty with the heart or mm -hmm. also known as the rigid. So they say that this character structure develops in um, usually around, it's like age 12-ish um, when we really need to trust ourselves. And so it's a very delicate time in our development where we really need our inner world of thoughts and feelings and imaginings. And we need to be able to trust ourselves and trust how we show up in the world. And a lot of times, um, if we had a parent that was like highly critical or highly dismissive or rejected. So you were talking about the rule keepers following a set of, of rigid standards limits the heart, right? Yeah. So when we move our consciousness away from the core, from the inner world of sort of thoughts and feelings and fluid energy, and instead we run our life by our um, kind of like this rigid set of rules and achievements, and our energy is focused outward into the world, um, it creates this kind of like this arrested development. Um, we no longer trust our heart. Instead, we trust our ability to achieve excellence in the world. So a lot of times when the heart is closed, a person places all of their value on what they're able to achieve within the world. So a lot of times they're, they're, they're really incredible at worldly pursuits where like a thinker would struggle. Thinkers kind of really struggle in mm. the, the physical realm. An achiever excels in the physical realm, but they really struggle with vulnerability, um, with, with trusting themselves. <laughs> right right so 
So we move on to the fifth chakra, the creative communication system. Um, this is the, the, the shocker for me, the energy that has flowed where I, I really noticed it. This is one where I could, I, I knew for sure I could see the changes in my life and my environment when I was flowing through my throat chakra the most. Um, it, it changed everything about me, the way I communicate, the way I create. Talk to me about how this fits into your energy structure system. I'm curious. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please. I'm curious, when did you notice that chakra opening? Like what was the, did something um, shift in your life? Was it something, um, or was it always really strong? It opened for me in my senior year in high school when I was in debate. Um, when I was, uh, I was just really good at it. There was a point, you know, I, I, was, I was aware of it. I just knew that so, uh, suddenly the words that I was, I was saying changed and was different. Um, and my ability to create had changed. And I didn't realize it as much until later after I had researched and knew what had happened at that time. There was a significant time when I was in high school and it was like, okay, this, this is suddenly the, that I have this powerful voice and it, and it changed everything. I was able to communicate and express myself in multiple various ways. And it's been growing ever since. Um, I, for some people, I think their throat chakra opens and they're not aware of it opening. Sometimes it works against them. Uh, in my own opinion, sometimes they don't realize the power of their words or their creations. Um, so uh, that's kind of sort of what I went through. Uh, maybe you can tell me about your experience, but am I but getting that, that right from my interpretation of your book, right? Yeah, that's perfect because that's usually at the age where we're kind of trying on all these different hats, right? Like we're in high mm -hmm. school, we're you know signing up for different clubs or we find ourselves with different friend circles and we're kind of trying to find like our social identity. That's the right. level of the fifth chakra is like, now we've got this understanding of like, okay, I'm a body my body has these emotions and this, you know, these different feelings and I'm, I'm an individual and I have this desire to connect, you know, and to share myself, but what do I want to say? What, what is it that I'm going to share? And that's sort of like when the throat chakra opens, it's like, how do we take everything we we've, we've discovered from that point and express it? The throat is where it's the median where our ideas and our expression meet and come out of us as humans it's our most creative center i'm still fascinated I, uh, there's a video on on youtube where Sadhguru is opening throat chakras and like oh. in india and, and when he does this snakes show up it's like a regular thing and I, i'm always like what does that mean and like the snakes know they're about to open the throat chakras and i've I always like can you understand could you um decipher what that would possibly mean it's so cool. I honestly, I always see when I go into deep meditation, I always see snakes, specifically cobra snakes. And I've always right. associated them with the third eye and sort of psychic openings. But maybe it's just that higher frequency. Because once They're you start getting up to it, yeah, yeah, once you start getting up into the higher chakras, you're kind of ascending beyond the the density of matter, you know, like, mm -hmm. you think about the voice, and you can't you can you can obviously you can experience it, you can hear it, but you can't really, you can't touch sound in that way, right. the way that you could you like physically experience a feeling or an emotion moving through you. Vibration is a little bit different. Maybe they're just drawn to it. Right. But, but I do think there's sometimes a coordination when, when you start opening the third eye or the crown or running your energies, I start to see things like, you know, um, when my third eye starts to open, I start seeing a lot more birds you know, a lot more birds start showing up. That That's something I've noticed. Have you noticed anything like that? It's so funny that you say birds because I've recently just acquired, um, Mike and I, we got two parakeets and just last night we picked up our cockatiel. And I, okay. I'm wondering, you know, Egyptians were really fascinated with birds. If you right. think about Thoth, uh, Thoth the Atlantean had mm -hmm. a, you know, a bird head and um, a lot of their, you know, their Egyptian gods have, had bird heads. And right. I think there's something about that higher level of intellect, higher thinking. Um, birds aren't bound to the limitations that humans are. Right. They have an extra, you know, they have this added dimension, spiritual sight or flight, or, you know, even angels are depicted with wings. Like there's something about that soaring above the human, the limited aspects of being human. 
And I do think that I see animals symbolically all the time that are telling me about stuff I'm going through. I might see the raccoon and, and it's telling me what's so I, I might see the, the, the weasel and, and I see a lot more. And so I think they're related, but then, then I also totally. think that they might be related to the, the throat chakra. So we move to the, the chakra that everybody wants to open first. That's the one they want to focus on. They think they, that everything else, but I got to open my third eye, the sixth chakra. First of all, the, the, when we're talking about the sixth chakra, it's not the pineal gland. It's not a physical part of the body. When people think that it is, it is, it, it, the energy system may be located somewhere near there and related to it, but it's not a physical part of the body, correct? I don't believe that any of the energy centers are, them. they're all part of the subtle body, which right. is what makes them so kind of like elusive. You know, you can't quite. Right. So if I'm drinking too much fluoride, it probably doesn't matter that much. Perhaps the pineal gland can filter the energy into our physical experience a little bit, but it's, it, it's, it's not the focus, right? It's, it's, we're talking about philosophical issues, uh, in particular, mastering your mind, like you talk about, and uh, changing your mind, the, the, the aspects of the mind, the th stuff I talk about on my channel quite a bit. Which honestly, that was my favorite. That, that's like my favorite part of like the writing portion was that was like my favorite part to really write about, even though I do believe that the, the human stuff is where the work is. And that's why most of us avoid it. Like you yeah. said, everybody wants to open their third eye. Everybody wants to be super psychic. Everybody wants to commune yeah. with the universe. Nobody wants to do the work of purifying their human. But once you do the work of purifying the human, everything that happens up here has a wider anchor point to really come down and be powerful on the planet. Um, but yes, opening the third eye is like, I find it to be just like you were just talking about with um, the animal messengers. Mm -hmm. The third eye is where we learn symbolic sight. So we start to understand the language of the universe. The language of the universe doesn't speak to us in human tongue. It requires that we pay attention symbolically. It's learning a new language of paying attention. Like, oh, why did that snake show up in my dream last night? Or why does this keep this pattern keep showing up in my life? Why do I keep seeing that specific symbol? You know, sometimes like I'll see symbols in meditation and I'll have to pay attention to them. And then I'll start to like, you learn the language of dreams and intuition. And I think that's kind of like the real power of the sixth chakra is not so much of like profound psychic vision, although it often is, it's more or less learning to, um, learning to navigate the world of, of symbolism and learn, learn the language of it. So then that we finally move to the seventh chakra, the divinity system, you call it. Um, and so really for me, I, I, I'm still working on that. You know, it's connection to the high, to that higher universe. That's where I can connect to my higher self. Um, so talk to me about through this system, how you interpret the, the, that particular energy system. Yeah, I think the divinity system is where we really merge with the creative intelligence that gave rise to the, you know, the, ma the manifest world. It's like where our human identity completely and totally dissolves and we are no longer a self that we might find in the third chakra, right? To right. the third chakra, you really are a self. You really are separate. You really are limited. That's a real perception from that level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. The seventh chakra, the level of consciousness is complete unity, is non-duality, you know? So that's where all of the ascended masters that, that we study and that we worship, like that's the level of consciousness that they're teaching from. And there's a truth, there's a truth to that because there's, there's this ultimate liberation at that level where you completely are free from self. But I also think that like, if we are to experience being human, the goal is to learn to integrate that understanding and bring it down into limitation. For I'm, many of us, when I'm sensing energy and, and it's something I'm always working on, uh, sometimes I get better at it than others, but I do sense different energies. I sense an energy coming up from the earth when I'm walking barefoot and I sense an energy coming down through my crown and it's sort of an intelligent energy coming down. It's sort of, a, and I find that they're different energies. Do you, do you think that there's seven different energies 
or is it one energy that's being de-intensified a little bit all the way down? That's what I, that's how I perceive it. It's, it's one energy. One energy. Expressed through many different vibrations, like many different like forms, I guess, but it's one, like one consciousness, one, it's like one verse, the universe is one truth that just manifests itself through these different levels of consciousness and based on our mind or our level of perception like we could have this conversation with a hundred people in a room and based off those hundred people's level of perception we might have been saying something completely different because you know because their their level of perception so it's like it's all just different fields of vibrating energy how we perceive it is unique. I, I like the metaphor of a laser that, you know, if you just directly go to the laser, it'll burn you directly. But if you deflect it off a mirror, it gets a little bit less intense. And if you deflect it off another mirror, it gets less intense. And it's, as it's going down, it's just each is like, a, uh, it's filtering the energy, taking a little bit. So that by the time it gets to the root, um, we don't explode. Because if we, if we had that running, at least at the beginning, when we're, you know, learning this energy system, there may be a point where we can access the crown chakra energy in our root. And perhaps that's a whole other form of evolution, but uh, that's my sense of it is that we're taking this incredibly intense godlike oneness energy that's coming through us and, and it's being um, filtered down. Yeah, I think it would fry our circuits if it all right. just like came through us. Like we can only manage so much. And that's why this kind of this um, gradual ascension I find is like more, um, it's more appropriate for us as humans. Yeah. Like I think that that level of consciousness is really trying to come down onto the planet. And that's why we're all having these like, you know, crazy spiritual awakenings and we're desiring spiritual wisdom. But we have to trust that like, we're only going to be able to integrate what our soul and what our constitution can allow you know, but the quest for knowledge is definitely like a wonderful precursor to expanding our ability to ground this consciousness, this high frequency. I remember when I was doing um, raw food and I had this um, really um, intense Kundalini awakening. And I remember thinking, and I remember that this, the, the level of energy that was coursing through my body was so high. The level was so intense that I remember thinking I'm, I can't, this isn't sustainable. I, the, like I had, I remember standing outside in the winter, completely barefoot, trying to like discharge some of the energy. And I think that's like, as humans, we, we pray for these crazy spiritual awakenings, but when they happen, they usually dismantle a lot of our, um, you know, our rigid energy barriers. So a gradual awakening to me. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> we were just talking about the intensity of like kundalini energy and um i think like so a, like a gradual process of like slow integrations like um gradual downloads <laughs> are really helpful i i do agree and, and when i was i've read several quo episodes where they mention the same thing that it's like uh you can blow out a circuit in in your body and and, and they even warn some um, you know, there are some medicines, plant medicines and psychedelics that you can take that will blow out one of the energy centers. And it, it, in some cases, it may, you may not in a single incarnation be able to recover from it. I mean, if we break, a, you know, something in our house, we can just change the, um, the fuse if a fuse breaks, right? But we can't do that in our energy body. So the, the, the gradual development of this energy allows, we, we don't blow a fuse, Right. That actually happened to me when I did Iboga. Um, I had, and I, I actually wrote the story in the book. I had these in the, in the experience, I was holding these big horseshoe magnets and there was this huge energy generating like outlet. And I would walk towards the outlet and I would plug the magnets in mm -hmm. and it would send this course of electricity through my body that was so intense that I, I would have to unplug my magnets and, and back up until I it ran through me and I would go back in and I would plug in again. And it was so intense of an experience. It lasted for probably two weeks after I did the plant medicine, I could still feel the energy moving through me. So right. that's why I think energy medicine is so important because we are energetic beings. Fundamentally, we're beings of energy and consciousness. What happens on the next level when we're running so much larger volume of energy. There must be another evolutionary level 
a new body, I would suspect, that we have that is starting a whole new system where we're, we're generating even more energy and filtering it down. How do you envision it, How, if, if that next level? I think it's, that's why I think the body work is so important because if the body isn't prepared for that level of energy, what, like, what, what do we do with it? What, what, how do, I think we're meant right now on the planet. I think we're meant to bring, bring more energy and more consciousness down into this plane. That's why I think really learning how to focus on the body, which is, can be very challenging, especially for highly spiritual beings. Um, where do we go next? I think I don't even think we can imagine it. I think it's beyond our scope of reality, but I think it's where we're going, especially with, you know, conversations like this that are becoming more and more popular. People are getting really curious. Do you think that we're gaining access to some new form of energy as we move in? I get the, I get the sense that there's light particles that we're starting to access, especially when I'm in nature in certain places that are more dense, that, that have way more information that, that cause, as we've experienced in this interview, that cause electronics to blow out, uh, that they, they integrate differently in the environment. It, 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 maybe it's the same energy, but filtered down, but it, it feels like we're, it, there's more of it, more of that higher level energy that is seeping into our environment on a regular basis. Maybe because everybody's bringing that energy down, that's the byproduct of it. I think so. I think so. It's like, there's like this highly, a lot, highly electrical charged. It's like this level of consciousness. That's like, I can feel it almost like static and it, yeah. it wants to ground itself on the planet. And so we're like lightning rods. It's like a, it's like a highly charged electricity and, and human beings can be the conduit. We can be the lightning rod that, that brings this consciousness down onto the planet. And that's why I think yoga and Qigong and all of these ways that we help our bodies get almost like we become um, receptive to the energy. We create the space for it. And once I have a fully energy flowing body, what can I do with this energy? Are there things I can do with it? Can I create energy balls? Can I, use, can I, can I do magic with it? And in, in my fully expressed energy body with my energy running through, what would you say we can do with it? anything you want anything is possible <laughs> you can create you, that's what the masters told us too on this on this frequency we create through our energy field alone like our energy field does the creation and it's an incredibly high frequency so it's usually vibrating at like love or above so whatever manifests is usually beyond our wildest dreams things that we can't you know we can't even really envision um, have you, you've read the work of David Hawkins, power verse force, yeah. letting go the eye of the eye, you know, in his, um, in his so good. Yeah. For so, sure. you know, in his, his, um, his chart, like his human consciousness chart. And he talks about that level of consciousness that he says, you know, people look at these, you know, beings who vibrate at that level and they think, oh, their lives are so, you know, they're, they're so blessed or they're so lucky, but no, their, their energy field, the, the human is not doing the creating at that point. The will, the third chakra is not doing the creating. The consciousness of the whole field is creating magic. And I've experienced that multiple times in my life when I'm having that frequency mm -hmm. and these things happen around me that I know, like there's no part of my human will that willed that to happen right. something in my field allowed the space for that to manifest through me and into my experience it's so well said and, and, and the concept of the field is important we have the energies running through us and in, in our body but as it grows and as we filter this energy it goes beyond our body we are not just this physical body the energy that i can perceive sometimes perceive with my mind maybe 50 feet, 100 feet, but I know it goes farther. Um, how, how, are you, how good are you at perceiving the field of energy around you? And do you see a world where like people's energy fields are expanding? We're walking around in these interacting fields as this energy becomes more and more, right? That's kind of how I see it. 
Yeah, the, the I think Einstein said something about, you know, the illusion of separation, you know, like really appearing real, but being a stubbornly persistent illusion. And, you know, consciousness is it, it, it connects all things all the time. These, these limited perceptions that our brain would convince us is reality is so unbelievably limited. Our energy is everywhere at all times. We're not, you know, we're not bound consciousness. Is, I don't think it's bound at all it's it's really it's it's the building blocks of everything right but so i do i see i see auras around people um mm -hmm. i don't see colors but i will witness usually when a person is incredibly happy passionate tapped in or teaching or speaking about something they love i will watch their energy field really grow and radiate i've seen it up to 12 feet if a person's channeling um I've seen beings like come in and really, it's really profound. So mm -hmm. I don't know how expanded it can get, but I'm assuming it's limitless. Right. So we're, we're slowly expanding these fields and um, for higher beings with being able to see more, just see us as globules of energy that are slowly growing outward is how I see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> spinning globules of energy right <laughs> it's it's wild it's amazing sometimes they come in as orbs too like i'll see like right. it, it depends like if a person's guide is coming in i'll just see like this colorful orb enter the room and it'll just be around them and then it'll go so i think we're we're always interacting with things that we're are so far beyond our perception it's but true. the more we expand our consciousness the more we integrate those experiences in. Like, I remember thinking it was so strange when I first started seeing auras or the little star lights around people. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking, oh my God, like something's wrong, <laughs> you know? And right. now it's it's been long enough for me to realize why oh, I'm just perceiving things that are that have been here the whole time. We're just developing our sensitivities to, to experiencing them. So let's make this system practical. Let's somebody comes to you and they say, I'm always getting a stomachache all the time. And, and, you know, I get worried and stressed. I'm nervous. I'm anxious. Heal me. What do you say in that situation? I usually ask a lot of questions about, right. you know, and, and try to get them to start asking the questions that'll awaken the healer within, right? We right. all have the capacity for self-healing. It's inborn. You know, we don't have to tell a mm -hmm. cut how to heal that that's inborn. But mm -hmm. what we do have to do is become mindful of our behaviors. So if someone's always having issues with the stomach, that's the personal will center. It depends on, so some people can be really excessive with their energy, right? An, an excessive will is going to look like constant dominance. They're always at war with their surroundings. They're always trying to defend or protect themselves aggressively someone who has a deficiency in the third chakra doesn't have enough self-protection. They're constantly being invaded by other people. Other people are using their will against that person or to, to use that person's energy. So my, my go-to is always teaching people how to ground themselves, how to fill up their own energy field, mm -hmm. establish boundaries, and really claim their own space, fill up your own field. If your whole field is full of your essence, you're going to be less likely to be taken advantage of. Right. So somebody comes to you and they say they have major neck pains and, uh, you know, it, 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 it hurts all the time. I can't give my doctor doesn't know why heal me. Hmm. Well, you think like, so the neck is sort of like the, the area of self-expression right? Nice. Sort of like the throat chakra and the shoulder, like shoulders are just kind of a lot of times it's like carrying a heavy burden, constantly feeling the weight of um, the world on their shoulders. So kind of like asking them, okay, like, you know, like, where, where are you holding back? And again, just kind of getting people to ask themselves, how yeah. do I live and express? And then I would give them my book. <laughs> and I right. would say, I would say, read every single chapter, answer all of the questions and analyze how you run your energy through your human system, because this system is a vehicle for consciousness. And once you learn, once you have the map, once you have the blueprint for how energy runs through you, then you can start to direct it in a way that you intend, as opposed to a way that you were programmed for. 
Kristen Fraser Johnston is an amazing author. And I, I'm so excited because in our first interview, the book was an idea. You had started writing it, but you followed through. And it's not just a little book. It's, it's, a, it's a book with a lot of meat to it. Now, obviously, I'm reading books all the time on my channel. This, this is one of the best books I've read all year. And there's so much. I, I could talk to you for um, in little sections. You have little where you go off on some beautiful tangents. There's so much that you brought to this. And so I, I know how hard that is. And it's, it's a huge accomplishment. You're um, at least one or two people. And that's how when I, when I wrote my book, you know, one person's going to read this book. It's going to change their life. I promise you it's changing lives and it's growing exponentially. And I can't wait to see what happens with this book. I recommend it. You can get it on Kindle. You can buy it on Amazon. I'll have links in the description of this book. Just, just get it. I promise you, it'll expand your understandings of chakras and the energy system, but so much more. So I want to get an idea of your, your everyday routine, your rituals, what, what you do um, with these understandings. Tell me about a normal day. You wake up. What is it you do? Tell me a little bit more about your, your rituals, what sort of patterns that you've developed over a single day. <laughs> so because I'm a thinker, I really struggle with um, containment, like with, yeah. with regularity. I, um, having a regular routine is my great, as much as I'm like, I want that so bad and I'm going to be so organized and so scheduled. I am a creative idealist. I spend a lot of time in the imagination and my ideas and in these potentials of like, oh, maybe I'll start a podcast or maybe I'll write another book or, and I right. create. That's what I do with my energy. I am always finding different ways to creatively express myself. And I know you and I are very similar in that very way. Much, yes. Sometimes I'm painting. Sometimes I'm wire wrapping jewelry because I love working with crystals and gemstones. Mm -hmm. My question is usually, how do I express love today? And I spent a lot of time wanting it to be scheduled and wanting it to be structured. And what I realized was I don't have a chakra for that. And I, once I accepted that, I stopped like banging my head against the wall, thinking I should be other, someone other than who I am. And so now I just ask myself, what would I love to create today that could bring value to the, to other people's lives, as well as to my life? How do I serve with my gifts and talents in a way that feels good and makes other people feel good. Perfect. Now, do you meditate? Do you have I do. time that you meditate? When I, when it feels like love, <laughs> I don't, I'm, you know, yeah. usually at night I do. I like to meditate at night um, because that's kind of how I clear the day. Um, but it's, it, it's never consistently scheduled, but I do meditate every single Thursday night with a wonderful group of people at quantum quantum healing collective. Do you, um, do you, do you use affirmations? Do you use any other techniques that have helped you? This is, this may sound bold, but I feel as though I have become the technique. Like, yes. like, do you know, does it, does that make sense? It's almost it like I, I've cultivated a lifestyle of gratitude, a, a lifestyle of connecting with love so much that when I don't feel loving that I'm like, I notice it right away. And I, mm -hmm. so it's like, once you do this work consistently and the work becomes your way of life, not like something you do to fit into your life, but literally like you become it, then you just, you recognize so quickly when you're not present with what, you know? Um, right. Do you have, at this point, do you have a diet that's helped that you think that relates to your energy structure that you, that, that you use more regularly? That's the one thing I, I probably struggle with the most is um, like addictions to foods and foods that make me feel mm -hmm. really good it. right away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like cookies, sugar. It's like, but I constantly notice the impact. Like if I'm doing a lot of raw food, like if I'm juicing a lot, my consciousness is really tapped in. There's something about the life force, like the prana that's in um, like raw fruits and vegetables. I really for my body, raw food, there's nothing better. Like lots of really good quality water, lots of really good um, like fruits and vegetables and just raw living food. My body yeah. loves it. But my taste buds really like French fries. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> well, I mean, at the same time, I think there's an energetic level where it does not matter what you eat. That you, you, it, your body will process it. You won't have any innate. There's, I've reached certain energetic, you know, it, it, it won't matter. When you eat that fried chicken, it's not going to matter, you know? So I, I, I don't know. About that. Yeah. So it's always a learning experience. And another thing is, I think it's different for everybody a little bit with the diet. Some people don't respond to the raw food diet as much. And some people do, at least in, you know, as I've observed, because, um, you know, that's a big thing in certain communities. You know, I, I agree though, the raw food diet seems like it's awesome. I was talking to Kyle Cease yesterday and he said the same thing. He, that was a big part of his awakening. He started just eating raw food, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I always tell people like, follow, follow the body. And I think, um, Paul check says that too, like, you know, cause some people say, Oh, don't, don't eat meat. Don't do this. If you're following it from here, what you think is going to get you somewhere right. already, you've missed the mark. If right. it feels it's like what it's, a, it's like a really fine line to walk because it's like, what feels really good in a moment. But I also know that like, you know, opiates at one point felt really good in a moment and ended up being right. not so good long term. So you have to be very, very mindful of your intention behind behind what you do. That's really what it all comes down to. What's my intention here? You know, is my intention love, right? If I'm making a juice and I'm like, I really love doing this, this feels like love, then it's probably going to be well received by my body. But if I'm doing it because I'm trying to be very rigid or structured or withholding or i feel like i need to lose weight then it's not an expression of self-love it's like self-negation Kristen frazier johnston heal the people expanding human consciousness for a global awakening check the links in the description get this book thank you so much for coming on you'll have to come on soon with the next book or before that and we can talk about this stuff some more um, keep up the great work. Thank you for your service. I appreciate it immensely. Thank you, Brian. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.